Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> it's not church, kids. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the USHCC's presidential candidate Q&A. My name is Javier Palomares, and as president and CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I have the honor of representing 3.2 million Hispanic-owned firms that together contribute over $486 billion to our American economy every year. We also advocate on behalf of 250 major American corporations, and we do this through our network of over 200 local chambers and business associations nationwide. And while the USHCC represents the interests of businessmen and women who happen to be of Hispanic descent, we never forget that we are first and foremost American businesses. In every tax bill we pay, every job we create, every product we manufacture, and every service we provide goes to benefit this American economy. This event follows headlining stories concerning the involvement of presidential candidates with America's Hispanic community. To his credit, United States Senator Ted Cruz was the first candidate to reach out to us asking to address our constituents. As an association that represents literally millions of Hispanic business owners, we have an accountability to ensure their voices are heard by each candidate, not only as business leaders, but as taxpayers, campaign donors, and ultimately as voters. This Q&A session will be the first in a series. This forum is meant to set the record straight on a wide array of issues that concern Hispanic Americans, including jobs, the economy, health care, the federal budget, immigration, and national security. Frankly, issues that affect all Americans. We'll spend 30 to 45 minutes in conversation between myself and the senator, and then take a few questions from the audience. With that, I'd like to welcome United States Senator Ted Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Senator, for joining. Again, thank you, Senator, so much for joining us. We're, we're thrilled to have you with us. Thrilled and, to be here. And I, I, we just have two basic ground rules, please. No filibustering <laughs> and no green eggs and ham. We agree, right? Um, seriously, we are, we're, we're thrilled that, that you made time to, to talk to our constituency and share your thoughts and your views about what are the most pressing issues of our time. Now, you're running for President of the United States, and as President, uh, you would be our nation's Commander-in-Chief. Now, just a few minutes ago, you were in dialogue about Iran. And, um, and other issues that I think are critically important to the national security of this nation. So first, uh, we'd love to hear kind of your synopsis uh, on your views on Iran, but we'd also like to hear your thoughts on other national security priorities, such as cybersecurity mm -hmm. and energy independence. Right. Both are issues that are very important to our constituency. Mm -hmm. So again, mm -hmm. Iran, cybersecurity, and energy independence, sir. Well, terrific, Javier. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And, and those are all incredibly important and pressing issues. Uh, on national security, let me speak first in terms of principles and then specifically on the three, uh, three issues you brought up. In terms of principles, I think front and center in this next presidential election is going to be restoring America's leadership in the world. I, I think for six years, we have seen the consequences of the Obama-Clinton foreign policy, of leading from behind. And it doesn't work. The entire world is a more dangerous place. Our friends and allies, they don't trust us. And our enemies don't fear us. And what one hears consistently across the globe, a couple of months ago I was in Munich at a national security conference there. 60 or 70 close allies of America were there, heads of state, foreign ministers, defense ministers. 
one after the other what they say when they pull you in the hallway in hushed tones. They say, where is America? We can't do this without America. America is the indispensable nation. And so I think that is going to be front and center a critical issue in this next presidential election. Now, when it comes to Iran, I think the threat of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons is the single gravest national security threat facing the United States. This is a nation that expresses unmitigated hostility to America. There's a reason they call Israel the little Satan and America the great Satan. And I believe what we're doing right now, this deal that President Obama is pushing, is repeating the mistakes of the Clinton administration in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration led the world relaxing sanctions against North Korea. Billions of dollars flowed into North Korea, and they used that money to develop nuclear weapons. We have literally recruited the very same person, Wendy Sherman, who led the failed North Korea talks to lead these Iran talks. And here it's qualitatively more dangerous because Iran is led by theocratic zealots who in the middle of these negotiations, a senior Iranian general said, the destruction of Israel, the annihilation of Israel is, quote, non-negotiable. That's right in the middle of these negotiations. In the middle of the negotiations, Iran practices a military exercise targeting an American naval ship. In the middle of these negotiations, Ayatollah Khamenei leads masses of Iranians in chanting death to America. One of the great principles of history is if someone tells you they want to kill you, believe them. So it is my hope that Congress will stand up and stop a bad Iran deal, and I am doing everything humanly possible to urge my colleagues Republican and Democrat, not to acquiesce to a deal that allows Iran to acquire nuclear weapons and, and to profoundly jeopardize our national security. Now, the other two things you asked about were cyber. energy and, and, and cyber cybersecurity. Security. Listen, if you look at cybersecurity, we're seeing the, the, the threat of cyber warfare is a growing threat. We saw North Korea hacking Sony pictures. We saw ISIS hacking the Pentagon's Twitter feed. This is a growing threat, and, and, and there are real concerns in the military that we have not developed sufficient expertise, technology to combat this. We need to be vigorously going after bad actors. One of the reasons North Korea, for example, feels so able to engage in cyber attacks with impunity is they have nuclear weapons, and that in turn makes them more aggressive on other fronts. It's one of the real consequences. If, if the Obama deal goes through and it allows Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, there are two possibilities. One, God forbid they would actually use those nuclear weapons. And when you're dealing with religious zealots who glorify death and suicide, that is far too great a risk for us to be willing to gamble on it. But the second alternative, even if they acquired nuclear weapons and didn't use it, we would see two things happen. We would see immediate nuclear proliferation throughout the Middle East. As the Arab nations in the Middle East have made very clear, if Iran gets nukes, they're going to get nukes as well, because they don't trust that Iran wouldn't use those nuclear weapons. But you, what you will also see, Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. An Iran with nuclear weapons, with billions flowing in from relaxed sanctions, will use those billions right now today to fund Hezbollah and Hamas and radical Islamic terrorists throughout the world and will also, like North Korea, be more vigorous in cyber attacks because with a nuclear weapon they will believe themselves immune from retribution. And so it is a dangerous scenario. It's a scenario where we need to be putting far more resources and effort to protecting ourselves against it. Now the third question you asked, and this is kind of a a complicated compound question mm -hmm. uh, is energy independence. Mm -hmm. You know, energy independence, we are right now experiencing an American energy renaissance that, that, that is breathtaking. One of the things I know we're going to talk about is economic growth, which is my top priority in office. 
And it is an incredible blessing that at a time when we so desperately need new growth, we're experiencing an energy renaissance that is creating millions of high-paying jobs. I've introduced in the Senate legislation called the American Energy Renaissance Act. That is the most comprehensive, serious energy legislation in the Senate to, number one, remove the impediments from the federal government to exploring and developing our resources. And number two, to opening up new federal lands, new waters to exploration and development. We have the prospect of, number one, within the next decade, becoming energy independent throughout North America. And number two, creating millions of high paying jobs at the same time. And this ought to be an area of bipartisan agreement. Unfortunately, the modern Democratic Party has decided that, that developing our, our energy resources is, is counter to their political objectives. We saw just a couple of months ago, the Democrats stand together and President Obama stand up and, and veto the Keystone Pipeline, which would have immediately created tens of thousands of new jobs and is just a small measure of what we should be doing. We should be thinking far more aggressively, unchaining the economic engine that, 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 that is this country. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you, I couldn't agree more on the uh, America as the indispensable nation and, and, uh, and, and your position on Keystone Pipeline. But with that, it's a, it's a good segue to, to my next question. Let's talk about the economy just a bit. Uh, during your announcement, you said you wanted to help generate, quote unquote, booming economic growth for all Americans. Right. And as you know, small businesses create two thirds of all new jobs in this country. And Hispanic businesses are at the forefront of that growth, starting at three times the national average and contributing at this point $486 billion to the American economy. So the question is, as president, how would you continue to spur the growth of all American small businesses and specifically Hispanic owned firms? Tremendously important question. You know, right now today for the first time in history, a majority of Americans think that our kids will have a worse life than we did. 65%. That has never been true in the history of this country until this moment. It is a profound shift in the hope and optimism and future of the American people. And I think the central issue in this next election is going to be reigniting the promise of America, getting back to the America that all of us grew up with where our kids would have a better life than we did and their kids would have a better life than they did. Central to doing that is the question you just asked. Bringing back jobs and economic growth and opportunity. My number one priority I mentioned a minute ago in the United States Senate has been economic growth because growth is foundational to everything else. You want to solve the deficit or the debt. You want to maintain our military strength. You want to reform and preserve entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, so they're there for future generations. With growth, we can do all of them. Without growth, we, can, we can't do any of them. Historically, the economy has grown 3.3% a year since World War II. There are only two four-year periods where growth averaged less than 1%. 1978 to 1982, coming out of the Jimmy Carter administration, and 2008 to 2012. Same failed economic policies. When the federal government engages in out-of-control spending and taxes and regulation, the result inevitably is stagnation, misery, and malaise. Now that gives the flip side the answer, how do you turn it around? Mm -hmm. We understand cause and effect. Every time the federal government has pursued tax reform and regulatory reform, the result has been incredible economic growth. That was true in the 1920s, it was true in the 1960s, it was true in the 1980s. And in this next election, that is front and center. You know, the reason economic growth is my top priority is because I am charged with representing 27 million Texans. And it doesn't matter if you're in East Texas or West Texas or up in the Panhandle or down where you're from in the Valley. The number one priority of Texans, regardless of party, regardless of politics, is jobs and economic growth. That ought to be a bipartisan objective. Unfortunately, right now, Washington's dysfunctional, and you're not getting the parties coming together on basic economic growth. When it comes to tax reform, 
We right now spend about $500 billion a year on tax compliance, on lawyers, on accountants, on just dealing with paperwork from the federal government. That is roughly the budget of our entire military. Every bit of that is deadweight loss. You want to spur economic growth among small businesses, and you're right. Small businesses are the generators of growth. When you hammer small businesses like we have for six years, with out-of-control taxes and regulation, it kills job creation. On the other hand, if you have fundamental tax reform, and I'm campaigning on a simple flat tax, where every American can fill out their taxes on a postcard. Now, that's something that's been talked about for a long time. There are a lot of other people who have worked to build the foundation for doing that. Steve Forbes spent a long time doing that. Dick Armey spent a long time doing that. But I think there's something that's changed in recent years that has changed the political terrain on this issue, which is the politicization and the weaponization of the IRS. As we've seen the IRS being used to target those who are perceived to be political enemies of the president, that has changed how this issue resonates among the people. And I think 2016 should be a referendum on abolishing the IRS and adopting a simple flat tax. And then number two, on repealing Obamacare. Now, the truth of the matter, Javier, there are a lot of politicians in Washington, including a lot of politicians in the Republican Party, who are largely resigned to Obamacare being a permanent feature of our economy. Every two years, they'll campaign on repealing it. But they don't believe it will ever go away. And, you know, one of the central reasons I have fought so hard against Obamacare, when I'm back in Texas, one of the things we like to do is we do small business roundtables. We've done 10, 20, 30 of them all over the state, where we get together small business owners around a table and we have an, a wide open Q&A where I'll just ask people, go around the table, introduce yourself, share something that's weighing on your heart. We have never done a small business roundtable in Texas where at least half of the small business owners didn't cite Obamacare as the single biggest challenge they were facing in their businesses. You know, I remember one we did in Kerrville in central Texas in the Hill Country. We were meeting in a restaurant bar. The owners of that bar, a husband and wife, said they had a great opportunity to expand their businesses, to expand at just about double the size of their business. And they thought from a business perspective it was terrific. But they said they'd already decided to pass on it. They turned it down. And they said the reason is they had about 40 employees. And if they expanded, they'd cross the threshold to over 50. And Obamacare kicks in at 50. And they said if we fall under Obamacare, it'll drive us out of business. So we, didn't, we said no. The first four or five small business owners at that Kerrville Roundtable all said the same thing. Every one of them had opportunities to expand their business. They all had 30, 40, 45 employees, and every one of them had said no because of Obamacare. Around on the right of the table was another gentleman, had a manufacturing company. He made hunting blinds. He described how he had already moved his manufacturing overseas, moved it to China. And he said, listen, I would like to be manufacturing right here in Texas. And he said, this would be about 150 quality manufacturing jobs here in Central Texas. But if I put it here, we're subject to Obamacare. And I can't be competitive under Obamacare, so I've moved it overseas. The final woman on the right in this round table was, was a woman who owned several fast food franchises. And she had enough restaurants that she was well over the 50 employees. So she didn't have the option of staying small. She described how she had already forcibly reduced her employees' hours to 28, 29 hours a week. And, and, and her voice started to choke up. She said, listen, a lot of these employees have been with us five or 10 years. These are single moms. These are people who are struggling. They can't feed their kids on 28, 29 hours a week. But they can't feed their kids if I go out of business. And Obamacare kicks in in 30 hours a week, and if I'm under it, I go out of business. And you know, the, the real truth of it is, each of those small business owners, they were surviving. They were able to make ends meet. Their businesses weren't doing as well as they hoped, but they were able to survive. 
But think about all of the millions of employees, all of the busboys and waiters and waitresses and assembly line workers who would have had jobs, all of the young people coming out of school who would have had jobs that don't get on that first rung of the economic ladder. And we need leadership in Washington to stop the federal government from making lives harder and harder for small businesses and instead to relieve the burden and let small businesses do what they do best, which is create jobs. Let, let's talk a bit about the Hispanic electorate, Senator. Mm -hmm. In 2012, uh, Governor Romney uh, failed to garner uh, at least a substantial portion of yep. the Hispanic vote, while President Obama garnered some 72% of yep. that same vote. Never before has the Hispanic electorate played such a pivotal role in electing an American president. And I believe that never again will an American president be elected without openly courting the Hispanic vote. And here's why. Today in America, every 30 seconds, a Hispanic turns 18 and becomes an eligible voter. That's a potential 52,000 new voters each month, and that's going to be the case for the next 21 years in a row. Now, this question comes from our Hispanic Chambers of Commerce right. in San Francisco. Right. And the question is, as a presidential candidate, what will you do to inform, mobilize, and attract Hispanic voters in 2016? It's a great question. It's a very important question. Uh, you know, in my view, I think the Hispanic community is a fundamentally conservative community. If you look at the values that resonate in our community, they are faith, family, patriotism, hard work. You know, some years ago I was having lunch with an Hispanic entrepreneur in Austin. And he asked me a question. He said, when's the last time you saw an Hispanic panhandler? And it's a great question. You and I grew up in Texas. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen an Hispanic panhandler. And the reason is, in our community, it would be shameful You'll go to, hell. to be begging on the street. <laughs> now, if you want people to work their fingers to the bones, hard work, you'll have Hispanic men and women lining up to work hard and provide for their families. Those are all conservative values. And I think the most potent ethos in the Hispanic community is the American dream. It is what we believe in. It is the shared value in our community. Now, the simple truth is the Obama economy has been a disaster for the Hispanic community. The people who are hurting the most under the Obama economy are the most vulnerable. It's young people, it's Hispanics, it's African Americans, it's single moms. I think the biggest lie in all of politics is the lie that Republicans are the party of the rich. Truth of the matter is the rich do just fine with big government. Big business does great with big government. They have armies of lawyers and lobbyists and accountants. They get in bed with big government. The top 1%, the millionaires and billionaires who the president loves to demagogue, today earn a higher share of our income than any year since 1928. So I'm always happy whenever President Obama or Hillary Clinton talks about income inequality because it's increased dramatically under their policies. When you hammer small businesses and people can't get jobs, the people who are hurt the most are the people who are struggling. Now, how do you connect with the Hispanic community? Look, some of it is you, you go and connect with shared values asking for their support. One of the things I was very proud of, in Texas in 2012, I received 40% of the Hispanic vote at the exact same time that Mitt Romney was getting clobbered with 27% of the Hispanic vote nationwide. And so in our campaign, we spent considerable political money polling the Hispanic community to understand what exactly was going on. Texas is the only majority minority state in the country that is solidly Republican. And it's not rock and science that if Republicans get clobbered in the Hispanic community, Texas won't stay solidly Republican. When we polled Hispanic voters in Texas, what we found was markedly different from what gets reported in the media. 
Number one, the media repeatedly said the reason Mitt Romney got clobbered in the Hispanic community was because of immigration. That gets repeated 10 times a day on television. What I can tell you is the data don't bear that out. We asked Hispanic voters in Texas what your number one issue is. You know what percent said immigration? 3%, which is actually consistent with the polling you've done of your membership. 54% said jobs in the economy. And what the polling data showed is actually Hispanic voters agreed with Mitt Romney on, on a great many issues. Where he got clobbered was cares about somebody like me. Where he got clobbered was 47%. You remember the infamous comment that the 47% of Americans who are somehow dependent on government, who are not paying taxes now, we don't have to worry about them. I think Romney is a good man who ran a hard campaign. But I cannot think of a statement in all of politics I disagree with more strongly. I think Republicans are and should be the party of the 47%. You know, when I think of domestic policy, I try to think from the perspective of my dad, who in 1957, my dad fled Cuba. He'd been in prison. He'd been tortured. And when he came to America, he was 18 and he couldn't speak English. He had $100 in his underwear. And his first job was washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And he worked full time. He paid his way through school. He went on to start a small business, to become an Hispanic small business owner. And I try to think of policies over and over again. How would they have affected my dad when he was a teenage immigrant washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour? If Obamacare were the law then, the odds are very good he would have been laid off because it's the teenage dishwashers that are paying the price for Obamacare. If he hadn't been laid off, the odds are overwhelming he would have had his hours forcibly reduced to 28, 29 hours a week. And the entire delta, it was interesting, in the polling in Texas between me and Mitt Romney among Hispanics was entirely on the question of cares about someone like me, understands my values. I'll tell you something else that was also quite interesting. You pointed out the Hispanic Chamber, the incredible number of Hispanic small businesses across this country. Roughly one in eight Hispanic households in America is a small business owner. We are an incredibly entrepreneurial community. One of the most interesting questions we asked on, 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 in that polling is we asked people, do you or anyone in your family own a small business? Among Hispanic voters who said yes, if I remember the number correctly, 77% of them voted for me in that election. You didn't have to be the, the, the small business owner. If anyone in your family owned a small business, we won nearly 80% of that vote. I think that points to, to the avenue for people who believe in free enterprise, who believe in opportunity to do exceptionally well in the Hispanic community, which is defend those values of opportunity, of easing the means of ascent up the economic ladder to achieve the American dream. Okay. So I, I think that provides me yet another uh, wonderful segue. Let's talk about, uh, you talked about your campaign. Let's mm -hmm. talk about campaign advertising. Mm -hmm. um, this question uh, comes from our San Antonio Hispanic Chamber. Now you kicked off your campaign with a Spanish ad mm -hmm which uh, I think illustrated your efforts to reach the Hispanic community. Now concurrently, or more or less concurrently, you ran an ad in English. Mm -hmm. How would you address, the question is, how would you address the criticism from Time Magazine and others which says that the ads differed from each other? Because in the English ad, you mentioned your opposition to the Affordable Care Act, and the president's executive actions on immig immigration. But you didn't mention them in your Spanish ad. How do you respond to that, Senator? Well, look, criticism from Time Magazine or anyone else in the mainstream media is hardly surprising. And I promise you it will not be the last time. Um, at the end of the day, that's what the media is going to do. They are not neutral observers in this regard. The media are Barack Obama's chief protectors right now, and no one is more ready for Hillary than the mainstream media. So they will attack, and they will attack the hardest 
the candidates who are getting real momentum. Now, in terms of, and I, and I haven't even read what the, the Time Magazine article you're asking me about, so I don't know that specific criticism. What I can tell you is we put out a series of ads, all of which had different messaging. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, I mean, it's, it's ironic, I'm not sure there is a voter, Hispanic or non-Hispanic, who is confused about my views on Obamacare. And if there is, I have failed miserably because I have not been ambiguous mm -hmm. on my views on Obamacare. And I promise you, in the course of this election, I intend to make 2016 a referendum on repealing Obamacare <clears throat> and adopting a flat tax so we can bring back growth and economic opportunity. But to and, be clear, yeah. you did not mention it in your Spanish advertising. Do you intend to mention your opposition to the Affordable Care Act and the president's position on, uh, on immigration right. on a going forward ba basis in your Spanish advertising? Uh, uh, absolutely, I intend to keep pressing those issues in forums across the country. When I'm back in Texas, when I'm down in the valley, mm -hmm. I give the same speech in the valley that I give anywhere else in Texas. What I've endeavored to do in my, in my time in the Senate, at its very core, is simple. It's been two things. Number one, tell the truth. And number two, do what I said I would do. You know, I remember several months ago, Heidi and I were at the Children's Museum in Houston. We'd taken our little girls there to play for the afternoon. <clears throat> and as we were headed out, there was a police officer there, an African-American man, big guy, who walked up to me. And he said, you know, I didn't vote for you. But I'll say this. You're doing what you said you would do. I can't tell you the frequency with which people stop me and say exactly that. And so when it comes to Obamacare, if I say I'm opposed to Obamacare, I'm really opposed to Obamacare. It's not simply an empty campaign promise, and the reason I'm opposed to it is because it's hurting millions of people. Millions of Americans have lost their health care, have lost their jobs, have been forced into part-time work, have lost their doctors, have faced skyrocketing Agreed. health insurance premiums, and I think we need to reform health care, so that we make health insurance personal and portable right. and affordable. Completely, I completely get that, that, that part of your message, but specifically to the issue of advertising in Spanish, you will begin to talk about your opposition to the Affordable Care Act and so that the Spanish advertising mirrors the English advertising. Is that what I'm hearing you say? What you're hearing me say is that my messaging is going to be consistent throughout. I haven't written the TV ads for the coming commercials, so I'm not promising you that every ad is going to be verbatim. Well, you heard it here first. Whatever every other ad says. We're going to have lots of ads. I hope they are creative. I hope they are interesting. I hope they are, so they are funny. And I hope they cover a whole range of issues. So I don't want to make a promise to you where you then see an ad and say, well, here's an ad that didn't talk about this issue. Right. You know, my views are not difficult to figure out. Whether you, you like them or dislike them, I, I don't hide the principles I believe in my and, effort to fight. And I think in fairness, you have been consistent, but I would encourage the same consistency in Spanish as in English. But enough of that, let's move on. Immigration. Now this question came from our Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. As you know, Senator, um, Hispanics are not monolithic. In fact, according to our poll, which you referenced a while ago, conducted with 2,000 registered Hispanic business voter, uh, owners, uh, jobs in the economy, uh, national security, health care, and the federal budget all ranked incredibly important. Um, but on the issue of immigration specifically, mm -hmm. our association views immigration reform as an economic imperative. And while you were correct in saying that it didn't rank as the number one issue with everyone we polled, I can tell you that it was a unifying issue, and it did rank highly amongst all of the people that we polled. So the question is, how do you propose to best harness the power of immigrants to help our country continue to be the most competitive economy in the world? Right. On the question of immigration, I am long-term optimistic and short-term pessimistic. I'm optimistic in the long term because I think there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on immigration outside of Washington. I think there is overwhelming bipartisan agreement outside of Washington that we've got to finally secure our borders 
and solve the problem of illegal immigration. <clears throat> And I think there is also considerable bipartisan agreement outside of Washington that we need to improve and streamline legal immigration, that we need to remain a nation that doesn't just welcome, that celebrates legal immigrants. You know, I'm the son of an immigrant that came legally from Cuba 58 years ago. There is no stronger advocate of legal immigration in the U.S. Senate than I am. If you want to pass immigration reform, and I want to pass immigration reform, the way to do so is to focus on areas of bipartisan agreement. You focus on common ground. If you crafted legislation that secured the borders and improved and streamlined legal immigration, that legislation could make it through Congress. So why am I short-term pessimistic? I'm short-term pessimistic because I think neither President Obama nor the Senate Democrats actually want to solve this problem. I think they are treating immigration as a political cudgel where they want to use it to scare the Hispanic community and their objective is to have the Hispanic community vote monolithically Democrat as unfortunately they've succeeded in scaring the African American community to do that. One, one point that is worth keeping in mind, if you are a proponent of immigration reform, and I consider myself a proponent of immigration reform, Barack Obama had a Democratic majority in the House. He had a Democratic supermajority in the Senate where he could pass anything he wanted. It's when Obamacare passed. It's when Dodd-Frank passed. The first two years of his administration, he had carte blanche. And what did he do on immigration? Zero. Nothing. This is unfortunately being treated as a partisan issue rather than an issue. And what he's doing is focusing deliberately on the most partisan, the most divisive question in this debate, which is a pathway to citizenship for those who are here illegally. When the Democrats focus on that issue, they knew full well it would not pass Congress. And I think it's unfortunate to see this issue treated cynically for politics. It is my hope the next president, if I'm elected president in November 2016, it's my hope the next president will lead bringing people together on areas of common ground and agreement to put in place common sense immigration reform. But when it comes to economic growth and jobs, you know, it was quite interesting. In the Senate Judiciary Committee, I introduced an amendment on H-1B visas. Current cap was 65,000. The Gang of Eight bill, which I opposed because it, it made the problem worse, I believe. But the Gang of Eight bill had some positive aspects when it came to H-1B visas. It increased it from 65,000 to 110,000. Problem is that's not nearly high enough. That cap had been filled in five days and the data are compelling that every H-1B visa holder, every high-tech worker who comes in, produces between 1.7 and 1.8 American jobs. That they're pro-growth. Right now, what we're doing, we've got foreign students who come to America. They get graduate degrees in math and science and engineering. And then we send them back to their own countries where they start businesses, they create jobs, and they compete against us. It doesn't make any sense. So I introduced an amendment in the Senate Judiciary Committee to increase the H-1B visa cap Five-fold, from 65,000 all the way up to 325,000. When that amendment came to a vote, every single Senate Democrat on the committee voted against it. And Senator Chuck Schumer was quite candid. He explained, look, we cut a deal with the union bosses. We can't adjust these numbers. And so they all voted against it. I introduced another amendment to dramatically simplify and streamline legal immigration, to reduce the paperwork and burdens, also to eliminate the per-country caps. Right now, the per-country caps discriminate against a number of countries like Mexico, like China, like India. Every single Senate Democrat voted against that amendment to improve and streamline legal immigration. And they said the same thing. This is the deal we cut with the union bosses. I think the way to get something done is not to play the divisive politics, mm -hmm. 
that Senate Democrats have played on this, but instead to look towards common ground. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate your position on visas, and I'm happy to hear that you are a proponent, uh, proponent of uh, immigration reform. I hope that you can use your skills to convince your colleagues in the Congress to, to get on this, get on with it. Um, let's talk a bit about equal pay. It turns out that you and I have several things in common as we were chatting uh, backstage here. Uh, we're both Hispanic Americans. We're both uh, the sons of immigrants. We're both from the proud state of Texas. And we both married well above ourselves. Would you agree? A absolutely. In fact, as a managing director at Goldman Sachs, your brilliant and accomplished wife probably made more than you do as a senator. Th th and, th that is a fair, fair <laughs> estimation. <laughs> and she is a wonderful example of what intellect, hard work, discipline, and determination can lead to in this nation. Now, this question comes from our North Carolina Hispanic mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, and, and, it, and it goes like this. As, as you know, Senator, women's wages continue to stubbornly lag behind men's when doing the exact same job, with women earning around 70 cents on the dollar and Hispanic women closer to 60 cents on the dollar for the exact same job. Why is that first? And what would you do as president to address this disparity? You know, this is an issue that is very personal to me. Um, you know, I've grown up in a family with strong women. My mother is Irish and Italian, first person in her family ever to go to college. And she ended up getting a math degree in 1956 from Rice and going on to become a computer programmer at Shell. Now, you want to talk about two industries that were not welcoming to women. You've got the oil and gas industry and the computer industry. The intersection of both, my mom was a real pioneer. And she would tell me as a kid, she said she deliberately didn't learn how to type because she said, look, I understood the world I was living in. She'd be walking down the hall and she didn't want some man to stop her and say, sweetheart, would you type this for me? My mom wanted to be able to smile and, and with a clean conscience say, I would love to help you out, but I don't know how to type. I guess you're going to have to use me as a computer programmer instead. So I grew up, when my parents had their small business, my dad and my mom ran it together. I grew up watching a strong woman helping run a business. My aunt, my tia Sonia, my dad fought in the Cuban Revolution with the Castro guerrillas against Batista. He didn't know Batista was, uh, he didn't know Castro was a communist. My aunt fought in the counter-revolution against Castro. She was there once the revolution succeeded. And when Thea Sonia came to America, she ended up, she was a single mom. She raised my cousin Bibi as a single mom. Now, you want to talk about a fireball. I pity the person who gets in a disagreement with Thea <laughs> Sonia. She had, I, I, I don't know if, if you had, my everybody, guess is, Everybody has a Thea Sonia in our community. <laughs> well, she had in particular her chancleta, <laughs> yeah. which she could hit you at 20 paces. You'd be walking <laughs> along the living room, and she'd pull it off and just, <laughs> boom, in the back of the head, she could drop you. Um, and then, as you noted, my wife is mm -hmm. a tremendous businesswoman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and is my best friend. And I'll say it's interesting. Watching some of the challenges she's faced in the business world, I remember she was at one meeting in Texas where she was sitting with some old oil guys, and she had out a, a notepad. And one of those, one of those guys looked, looked to her and said, Oh, that's nice, sweetheart. Are you making your grocery list? <laughs> I'm still amazed that Heidi did not <laughs> kill him on the spot. Um, and it makes it real and, and personal when it, you see it in your family. So, and why do you think the chasm exists? And what would you do as president to, well, to kind of allay that? What I would say, number one, we've made enormous progress. The world today is dramatically different from the 1950s when my mom went to work. It's very different from the 1960s and Mad Men. There are tremendously successful women professionals in every industry. Now, are there still barriers? Is there still discrimination? Absolutely. But I do think we need to pause and acknowledge the distance we've traveled. 
And I also think, you know, we earlier were talking about the burdens to small business. Mm -hmm. The people who are hurt the most by that are those who are struggling to climb the economic ladder. And that disproportionately hurts women. Under President Obama, 3.1 million women and girls have entered poverty. Under President Obama, the median income for women has dropped $733. Because when you hammer small businesses, the people who get hurt are the single mom working in that fast food restaurant in Kerrville, Texas, who get their hours cut to 28 hours a week. And so I think by focusing on, we've got existing laws on discrimination, on pay discrimination that need to be enforced. But I think the real challenge is not passing another law and another law and another law. It's getting to an environment where small businesses are growing and hiring and prospering and expanding. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I think about my dad's approach to discrimination. My father would tell me as a kid, he said, look, when I came out of University of Texas, he graduated in 61, and he was applying for jobs. And at the time, well, even today, he had a very heavy Spanish accent. And he said, look, I, I'm obviously an immigrant. He said, if I'm applying for a job against an American, and I'm equally qualified with the American, they'll hire the other guy. Now, my father was not deeply upset about that. He said, you know what, in Cuba they'd hire me. It may not be fair, but that, that, that is, is human nature. So my dad's approach in 1962 was he said, listen, I'm just going to be three times as good as the other guy. I'll make it so you'd have to be an idiot to hire the other guy. And that has been the avenue. It's been the avenue in the Hispanic community. There are a lot of people in the Hispanic community who have had to take that at that, that approach. A lot of people in the African-American community, a lot of women who have said, I'll make the decision real easy for you. I'll run circles around the other guy. And, and that, we need to have the sort of environment where opportunity is plentiful and small businesses are growing and expanding, and that's how you improve the opportunities for women. Um, let's go on to corporate uh, equality. Mr. Senator, uh, here's, I think, another thing that, that we may have in common. We both have gay friends. Is that, is that correct? We both have gay friends. So you have, I think, a proven track record, and you've been very consistent, uh, and, and, and a very strong supporter of America's free market economy. But with those two realities, how do you feel about major U.S. companies championing issues like income inequality and same-sex marriage? Well, on the question of marriage, uh, I support traditional marriage, the union of one man and one woman. And, and I would note that is also the position that is very widespread in the Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a constitutionalist. And under the Constitution, the question of marriage is and has been from the beginning of this country a question for the states. State legislatures have determined marriage laws, and it's only in the recent few years that we've seen unelected federal judges and the federal government trying to tear down state marriage laws. And my view, I've spent most of my adult life fighting to defend the Constitution, fighting to defend the Bill of Rights, and I think we can answer a great many of the questions in this country by getting back to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, if you as an individual or a company as a Fortune 500 company decide as a policy matter, they support gay marriage. There is a constitutional avenue to make that argument, which is namely to convince your fellow citizens in the states to change their state laws. That's the mechanism the Constitution leaves for questions of marriage, and what that means is you then have debates about the policy merits of it, whether, whether it is a good idea or a bad idea. And what we would fully expect, you know, Supreme Court Justice <clears throat> Louis Brandeis referred to federalism, referred to the states as laboratories of democracy. And so there would be some states that if it were left to the states would choose through their elected representatives to change their marriage laws. But there would be other states, like you're in my home state of Texas, 
where the men and women of Texas have voted to preserve traditional marriage. And I think we should respect the constitutional structure. So as president, you would leave it up to the states to decide? Yes, okay. and, and I have introduced, indeed, a constitutional amendment to that effect okay. that would leave it to the states. Now, it's interesting, you mentioned the Fortune 500. And I do want to take a minute to visit on the role of big business in this issue that particularly became acute in the past few weeks in Indiana and in Arkansas. Now, Indiana and Arkansas, both their legislatures passed Religious Freedom Restoration Acts. And, you know, I have to say what happened in those states I found really heartbreaking. There was a time not very long ago when religious liberty enjoyed bipartisan support. Two decades ago, Congress passed the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed the Senate 97 to 3. It earned the support of such crazy right-wing nutcases as Ted Kennedy, John Kerry, and Chuck Schumer. It was signed into law by a Democrat, Bill Clinton. The laws that Indiana and Arkansas passed were substantively identical to that law. And yet what you saw was a perfect storm where unfortunately in the heavily politicized world of the gay marriage debate, the advocates, the modern Democratic Party has decided that their support for forcing gay marriage in all 50 states trumps any devotion to religious liberty. And as a result, they vilified the state of Indiana and the state of Arkansas for protecting religious liberty. That is a heartbreaking shift, and I'll tell you, Big business played a real role in that, jumping in and attacking religious liberty. And I mentioned before, I am a constitutionalist. I believe in the Bill of Rights. The very first liberty protected in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is religious liberty. And I think that's an issue that unifies us, that brings us together, brings us together across racial lines and ethnic lines and party lines, the support for religious liberty. You know, I was in Iowa just a week ago. I met with, a, with, with an older couple, Dick and Betty Odegaard. They owned on their property an old church that they had converted into a wedding reception hall. And they have it as an art gallery and a restaurant, and they had maintained that for a number of years. And they ended up being sued because it was inconsistent with their religious faith to host a gay marriage in the church on their property, in the church and reception hall on their property. They ended up being sued, and they were forced, under penalty of serious fines, today they don't hold weddings there anymore. They've shut it down. This couple in Iowa, a lovely couple in Iowa, had to shut it down. And what is this spirit of intolerance that says you must force people to violate their religious faith you know, if you think about it, we don't have an entitlement to force anyone else to violate their religious faith. We don't have an entitlement to go force a Jewish rabbi to perform a Christian wedding ceremony. You don't have an entitlement to force a Muslim imam to perform a Jewish wedding ceremony. We have a right in this country to re reflect our religious rights. And so, you know, it's come up, for example, with Christian florists who respect marriage as a sacrament, the union of one man and one woman, and they believe it's inconsistent with their faith to participate in a gay marriage. And the attitude is, let's find them tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars and crush them under our heel for following their religious liberty. You know, I would note, if you had a gay florist, and there may be one or two gay florists, and that gay florist didn't want to provide flowers to a fundamentalist Christian's wedding. That florist has every right to say, I don't want to participate in that. And I gave a talk a week ago in, in Iowa talking about the liberal fascism that is looking to suppress dissent and punish anyone who is living consistent with their religious views. I think that's a deeply troubling tendency, and I think, unfortunately, big business has been complicit in it, mm -hmm. uh, which is not 
a positive development. So you're not for big business getting involved in issues of this sort? I, I think big business can make its decisions in terms of what issues to get involved in, but, you know, my view, this town, I think there is far too much crony capitalism. There is far too much Washington picking winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And, and look, big business, I've got nothing against big business. If they build a better mousetrap, great. But they don't need government favors or handouts or subsidies. And often the way it plays out is big business gets those government favors at the expense of small businesses. And small businesses are where the dynamism is in our economy. As you know, to Tugel, it's a picture in 1978 of the founders of Microsoft. You got Paul Allen with long hair and a beard. He looks like one of the Bee Gees. You got Bill Gates with glasses the size of hubcaps. And the picture has underneath it the simple legend, would you invest money with these guys? And it's a great reminder that a bunch of kids woke up in the 1970s and said, we're going to take on Big Blue, IBM, this giant behemoth. And what an incredible country. There's no country on earth that allows that dynamism. Now today, Microsoft is the giant. And you know what? There are, there, there's a whole bunch of new kids in their parents' garage that are taking on Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. the reason your parents and my parents came to this country is there has been no country in the history of the world that has allowed so many millions to come with nothing and achieve everything. You look at other countries where government controls much of the economy where you have socialism in effect, you got rich people there. You have big business. What you don't see is new rich people. Mm -hmm. What you don't see is a whole lot of new big businesses because it calcifies everything. It freezes it. So if you're a have, look, you could be in a European socialist nation. You could live like a king. You might even be a king. Mm -hmm. You can have a Rolls Royce and a manicured yard, but you don't see the incredible opportunity that we have here, and that's what we need to bring back is that social and economic dynamism that lets people with nothing achieve okay. anything. So, so let's talk a, a little bit about race relations. I, I think, and by the way, this question comes from our Tulsa Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I think with everything that's gone on in Ferguson, New York, Tulsa, uh, South Carolina, right now in yep. Baltimore, literally yep. 30, 40 miles from here, um, and I know, I know you've given a statement already on, on the riots in Baltimore, but, but more broadly, yeah. as president, how would you address the racial tensions that stubbornly, stubbornly still exist in this country? Well, look, the, 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 there's no doubt there, there are real and meaningful racial tensions. What, what, what has been happening in Baltimore has been heartbreaking. And, and, and you're seeing a city right now that is afraid that, that, that children can't go to school, that men and women are afraid to live their lives. That our prayers need to be with the families of those who've been injured or killed. Now, the underlying facts of what occurred with Freddie Gray need to be investigated. They need to be investigated fairly and impartially to discover what happened. You know, I will say one of the things that has been very disappointing when it comes to questions of race relations. President Obama, when he was elected, he could have been a unifying figure. He could have chosen to be a leader on race relations and bring us together. And he hasn't done that. He's made decisions that I think have inflamed racial tensions, that have divided us rather than bringing us together. You know, in the last election cycle, when Joe Biden on the campaign trail said to an African-American group, they're going to put you back in chains. That kind of incendiary and hateful rhetoric is not just a, a minor malpropism. That is deliberately dividing and inflaming tensions. If you look to the history of America, America has been a beacon of freedom. Mm -hmm for centuries, but, but America's original sin was slavery. It was a grotesque and immoral institution 
Indeed, the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, was elected on a campaign to end slavery. But we have paid the consequences, the vestiges of that evil institution in this country. But I think we need leadership that brings us together instead of trying to divide us. I also think it has been very unfortunate, the animosity that's been directed at law enforcement. It is not beneficial to minority communities to vilify and target law enforcement. Police officers virtually every police officer is brave and honorable and risking his or her life to keep our community safe. Now are there bad actors? Sure. In any profession whatsoever, there are even bad actors in politics. Mm -hmm. But the vilification of law enforcement has been fundamentally wrong. And it has hurt the minority communities. You look at the communities where rioting is going on. You look at Ferguson, where you have minority small business owners whose businesses are burned to the ground. That's not benefiting the community, to terrorize the community. But to the question, Senator, what would you do to make the situation better if you were the president? A combination of things. Number one, most importantly, when it comes to tone and language and rhetoric, not have the president inflaming racial tensions, rather have the president working to appeal to our shared values. My campaign for president is based on reigniting the promise of America. The shared values that I'm focusing on are bringing back jobs and growth and opportunity, mm -hmm. defending our constitutional rights and restoring America's leadership in the world. Those are values that cut across racial and ethnic lines. They, they appeal to our better angels. Mm -hmm. Now, beyond that, do we need criminal justice reforms? Absolutely. And I've been a leader in the Senate on criminal justice mm -hmm. reforms. Mm -hmm. So I'm an original sponsor of the Smarter Sentencing Act that would reduce mandatory minimums for nonviolent drug offenses. There are far too many people serving long, long prison times, far too many young African-American men whose lives are spent beyond, behind bars. Mm -hmm. And I've joined with Republicans and Democrats in seeking legislation to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. We need to look at common sense reforms, also on the question of gun control. You know, following Sandy Hook, this is a great example. It was a horrible shooting at Sandy Hook. Every one of us who are parents, Heidi and I have two little girls, were shaken and horrified to see little children murdered by a madman. The president had an opportunity there to bring us together. He could have come together and said, let's come together and let's target violent criminals. Let's go after bad guys. And that would have brought Republicans and Democrats together. You would have seen Congress act, just like on immigration. You have a choice. Instead, the president made a decision not to focus on violent criminals, but to focus on restricting the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens, a longtime partisan goal of the far left of the Democratic Party. But, you know, it was striking, for example, and I think I remember these stats, but it's been a while, so these stats, if they're not accurate, they're the order of magnitude is accurate. My recollection was in 2012, I think it was, there were 54,000 felons and fugitives who tried to illegally buy a gun. Of those, the Obama administration prosecuted 44 of them. 44 out of 54,000. Now, I think that's completely unacceptable. When in, in Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, I asked representatives of the administration, why aren't you targeting the 54,000 felons and fugitives that are trying to illegally buy guns? One police chief said, we don't have time for paperwork offenses. Well, I got to tell you, if a felon is trying to illegally buy a gun, I'm interested in finding out why and stopping them. Likewise, when it comes to prosecuting gun crimes, prosecution of gun crimes, and again, it's been a while since I've looked at these stats, but my recollection is that they had dropped 40% under President Obama from the previous administration. 
So and, and the victims, the, the reason I'm <clears throat> focusing on this here mm -hmm. is the victims most frequently of gun crime are in the minority community. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on violent crime, and, and, and I joined with Chuck Grassley in introducing what was called Grassley Cruz. It was the law enforcement alternative during the debate on guns, and it focused on it, created a task force to go after gun crimes. It, it created, it, it devoted resources to prosecuting felons and fugitives who try to illegally buy guns. It put more resources into school, school safety. It ended up getting the most bipartisan votes of any of the comprehensive gun legislation. We got, I think it was 54 votes, including nine Democrats. Mm -hmm. And yet it didn't pass into law because Harry Reid, the Democrats, filibustered it. They blocked it. If you focused, now, now those issues should have brought us all together. None of the Democrats had a substantive objection to anything in the bill. Mm -hmm. Their view was if we can't target law-abiding citizens, we're going to filibuster and block anything that actually targets the bad guys. You know, I think what we ought to do in the minority community is come, number one, with language of inclusion and hope. Number two, protect those communities from violent crime address inequities in the criminal justice system. And then number three, I'll tell you a deep passion of mine is, is school choice. I think school choice is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And in both the African American community and the Hispanic community, you see support for school choice at 60, 70, sometimes as much as 80%. I think every child in America has a right to quality education regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or zip code. And that is an issue I think Republicans should go and, and, and campaign in the minority community. I intend for school choice to be an issue front and center, fighting to expand hope and opportunity okay. for, for, for low-income kids. Let, let's move on to the, uh, to the Republican primary. Now, this question came from our uh, Metro Orlando mm -hmm. Hispanic Chamber. Recent polls show Governor Jeb Bush and Senator Marco Rubio as front runners for the Republican nomination. Now, you recently said that Senator Rubio was, and I quote, a talented communicator, a friend, and that you had great respect for him. Now, let's assume, for, for just a moment, let's assume hypothetically that you were to lose the Republican nomination. Our friends in Florida want to know, would you be inclined to support Governor Bush or <laughs> Senator Rubio? You know, I, I don't intend to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, B if because you were I, to I, I don't intend for that hypothetical to come to pass. Mm -hmm. Look, look it, it, it is my intention, if I do not win the nomination, mm -hmm. I will support the Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. But I also believe, you know, I think the Republican nomination, there are a lot of good people uh, who are running, a lot of people who I like and I respect, who are friends of mine, who are talented. I think the core issue this race is going to come down to is trust. Who Republican primary voters trust to do what they said they would do? I mentioned to you the comment that the police officer at the Children's Museum mm -hmm. told. I didn't vote for you, but. You know, I'm reminded of another instance. A couple of months ago, I was in Iowa at an agriculture summit. And you had quite a few, most of the Republican likely candidates came to that. And it was a summit that was put on by the largest ethanol producers in the state of Iowa. And each candidate was asked their views on supporting the federal government's ethanol mandate. And every single candidate there pledged their support to the ethanol mandate. Indeed, a couple who had publicly opposed it did a 180 degrees backflip somersault to suddenly support it. And when I was asked that, I said, listen, I support ethanol. I support biofuels. When it comes to energy, I support all of the above. But I don't think the federal government should be picking winners and losers. We talked earlier about crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so I've introduced legislation to phase out the ethanol mandate. Ethanol will compete quite well and vigorously in the energy market without a federal government mandate. Now, I have to admit, when I said that, I didn't know what the reaction would be. I mean, this was a gathering of the largest ethanol producers in the state. The central purpose of the meeting was to have people come 
pledge their support for the ethanol mandate. I didn't know if they would boo me and throw tomatoes at me. But what I went on to say is I said, I understand a lot of people here would rather I said something else. You'd rather I say, I support the ethanol mandate forever and ever, amen. But every one of us has seen politicians who come to one group and say one thing, and then come to another group and say another thing. And we all know what happens. They go to Washington and they don't do what they said they would do. And I told the group, you can count on me for two things. Number one, I'm going to tell you the truth. And number two, I'm going to do what I said I would do. And astonishingly, the group burst into applause. And when I left the stage, I left to a standing ovation. Now, that was not what I expected or anticipated. But I do think it's a result. People are fed up with politicians who sound great on the campaign trail and they don't actually follow through and do what they said they would do. And I think that's going to be right at the core of the Republican primary is who has demonstrated that they will stand and fight for common sense conservative principles, for constitutional liberties that are the key to turning the country around. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say that I think that policeman in Houston was right. Uh, you have been consistent. Thank you. Uh, and though it's really, it, it's darn hard to get you to open up, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you uh, for doing this. I'd love to take some questions from the audience, if you're okay with that, Senator. Um, and, I, and I see Ray Dempsey right here. Uh, Ray, why don't we begin with you? Thank you, Senator. My name is Ray Dempsey. I'm with BP America here in Washington, D.C. I appreciated your comments about the energy renaissance and the extraordinary opportunity that we have yeah. to create real sustainable energy security for our nation. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the legislation that you've introduced, and yeah. I was grateful for that. I, I certainly encourage you and your colleagues to continue to work in that direction. As president, though, there'd be some other dimensions of energy policy that would be more directly within your yes. remit, whether it's regulation or the question around exports mm -hmm. um, or even things like approval of permits for projects like the Keystone XL pipeline. Would you share with us your energy policy priorities as president? Well, Ray, if I can quote uh, the movie Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello. Um, I think we need to unleash the energy opportunities in this country. And you're right, the president can do a great deal of damage unilaterally, as this administration has demonstrated, and the president can turn around a great deal of that damage unilaterally as well. You know, President Obama's fond of saying, he has a pen and he has a phone. Well, if you live by the pen, you die by the pen. And every illegal and unconstitutional executive action the president has been put in place by executive order can be undone by executive order. And so if I'm elected, it, it will be my intention to pursue every policy possible to bring back jobs and economic growth and opportunity, and energy pr pr presents an incredible opportunity to do that. So whether it is stopping the federal government from going after fracking, you know, fracking has enabled this transformation a decade ago. If I'd stood up here and talked about North American energy independence, you'd have laughed. There was no reasonable prospect of that a decade ago, and it is applying old technology to new situations that has unlocked vast shale resources, both oil and gas, transformed our ability to access resources. And so one of the real threats that I think we're seeing is the federal government threatening to go after fracking and, and to strangle this renaissance before it, it, it truly comes to fruition. Beyond that, you know, one of the frustrating things for someone who is an economic conservative is when Democrats are in office, regulations proliferate like mad. And when Republicans are in office, regulations proliferate a little bit more slowly. A, a cynical friend of mine suggested a bumper sticker. Republicans, we waste less. <laughs> Hardly a banner to march into battle over. We have never seen a president who uses the full constitutional authority of the presidency 
to rein in the regulatory state. What President Obama has done that is wrong with executive action is that he has intruded into the legislature's authority. Article I of the Constitution gives legislative authority, the authority to make law to Congress. And much of the president's executive actions and executive orders have intruded into that sphere. But when it comes to Article II, the presidency, there is one chief executive. And the modern regulatory state consists of, of Congress's efforts to tie the hands of the president. And we have right now, as you know, unelected bureaucrats who last from one administration to the next administration to the next administration, and that's part of why the Leviathan keeps growing and growing and growing. We've never seen a president that uses the Article II authority of the presidency to rein in the regulatory state, to reduce the job-killing burdens coming from Washington. But, and that is exactly what I intend to do. Let's go to, uh, I see CNN's Dana Bash. Dana? Hey, Senator. Hey, Dana. Um, I was going to ask you about what Hillary Clinton said today about Baltimore, when she effectively said that what's going on there is proof that the criminal justice system needs to be reformed. So I would like you to respond to that. But something that you said on the stage, I think, bears a follow-up, which is you said that President Obama has inflamed racial tensions in this country. You mentioned Joe Biden's comments during a campaign, but specifically the president. How has he inflamed racial tensions? I think he has not used his role as president to bring us together. He has exacerbated racial misunderstandings, racial tensions from back at the beer summit to a series of efforts to pit Americans against each other. And part of the problem is the way he advocates for any given plan is to, paint a, to, to, to build a straw man of the opposition and then to vilify and caricature it. So, so that, in the president's telling, anyone who opposes Obamacare wants people to be denied health care and to get sick and pass away. That that's the only reason anyone could oppose Obamacare is because you malevolently want people to suffer. When you come to an Iran deal, anyone that opposes this terrible Iran deal must be because they want war. And dividing us over and over and over again is a dangerous approach for a president. It's an irresponsible approach for a president. I think we need to be looking to unity. So uh, Phil Elliott, where's Phil? Philip Elliott from uh, the Associated Press. Phil? Let's go on to Alex Altman from Time. I think Alex might have a little. Yes. Alex? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. um, you reiterated your criticism of Democrats for pursuing a pathway to citizenship um, as part of comprehensive reform, but I wanted to see if you would clarify your position with respect to um, a pathway to some type of legal status for those undocumented immigrants who are already here in the United States. You know, when it comes to immigration, one of the challenges to resolving this is that we have history on this issue. In the 1980s, the last time Congress passed comprehensive immigration reform, Congress went to the American people and said, we've got a deal for you. We're going to grant amnesty to what was then roughly three million people living here illegally. And in exchange, we're going to secure the borders and solve the problem of illegal immigration. We're going to fix it. And the American people in the 1980s said, OK, those, those terms are acceptable. Well, we all know what happened. The amnesty happened, and the borders never got secured. So instead of 3 million people, we're looking at 11 to 12 million people here illegally today. And in the Gang of Eight bill, essentially Congress went to the American people with the exact same deal. It said, we're going to grant amnesty this time to 11 or 12 million people, and in return, we're going to secure the borders. 
And I think the American people quite reasonably said, we don't believe you. We've seen this deal before. When it comes to immigration, I don't think you have to solve every issue all at once. The American people have very good reason to doubt, both Democrats and Republicans, that we actually will secure the border because we've talked about it so long and have failed to actually accomplish it. I think to pursue immigration reform, we should focus on the areas of bipartisan agreement. We should focus on securing the border. I introduced legislation when the Gang of Eight bill was, was up. I introduced an amendment to triple the border patrol, to increase fourfold the fixed wing assets and rotary wing assets, to put in place strong E-Verify, to put in place a biometric exit entry system on visas because 40% of illegal immigration comes from visa overstays. Every Senate Democrat voted against that amendment. I think to begin, if you want to address comprehensive immigration reform, we need to focus where, or common sense immigration reform, you need to focus where there's agreement, securing the borders and improving legal immigration. And once we demonstrate we can secure the borders, I think then we can have a conversation about the people who are here illegally. I think until then, the American people don't trust Washington. And by the president's focusing only on the, on the 11 million people who are here illegally, what it does is ensures that no reform passes. It, it, it's the equivalent of putting a poison pill in the legislation because the Democrats know full well it's not going to pass Congress. Just to make sure that I understand, you basically said no on passing the I think we should address these issues one at a time. But it, you know, it was revealing in the course of the Gang of Eight debate. I introduced an amendment that eliminated a pathway to citizenship for those who are here illegally. And I pointed out that the amendment I introduced didn't change the Gang of Eight's underlying legal status, but it simply said there has to be a consequence for breaking the law, and the consequence is that you're permanently ineligible for citizenship. And in the, this was a public markup, so this debate is all public. I, I said there are three reasons I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Number one, I think a pathway to citizenship for those who are here illegally is profoundly unfair to the millions of legal immigrants who followed the rules and waited in line years, sometimes decades. In the course of this debate, legal immigrants get left out and treated unfairly over and over again. It's one of my biggest criticisms of the Democrats. They're so focused on those here illegally that they don't focus on those who follow the rules and came here legally. The second argument I gave why the amendment should be adopted is that a pathway to citizenship we have seen only encourages more illegal immigration. And I'll tell you, living in a border state like Texas, you see the real consequences of, of women and children who are sexually assaulted, who are brutalized, who are left to die in the desert, being brought in by coyotes who are transnational criminals and cartels. It is the opposite of humane or compassionate to continue a system that incentivizes more and more illegal immigration. But the third argument I gave, as I said, even if you disagree with both of those arguments on the merits, it is abundantly clear there are not 218 votes in the House of Representatives for a pathway to citizenship. So if anyone on this committee actually wants this legislation to pass, you should accept this amendment because it's the only prayer this legislation has to pass. And the exchange, Alex, I think was the most revealing exchange in the entire immigration debate, which is Senator Schumer from New York leaned forward and said, if there is no citizenship, there can be no reform. And, and my response to Senator Schumer, I said, well, I want to thank the senator from New York for his candor. He's been very explicit. There is one overarching partisan political objective in this debate, and that trumps everything else. He's willing to say to everyone concerned about national security and securing the borders, if he can't get 100% of his partisan political objective, he's willing to do nothing, zero, to secure the border. 
He's willing to say to the high-tech community that the Democrats campaign in all the time saying they're going to help them get more high-tech workers. He's willing to say if he can't get 100% of his partisan political objective, he'll do nothing zero in the high-tech community. He'll do nothing zero for the farmers and ranchers who need more help. And most revealingly, what Senator Schumer is saying is to the 11 or 12 million people here illegally, if he can't get 100% of his partisan political objective, he's willing to do nothing zero for them as well. Now, I think that's cynical, but it's also very candid that there is a political objective that trumps solving the problem. We've gone 25 minutes over our allotted time. Uh, so one final thought from you, Senator, and, and, and finally, uh, uh, this last question, and, and I think this is an opportunity uh, for you to tell the 3.2 million Hispanic businesses in this country, our 250 corporate partners, our 200 local chambers, and frankly, the 53 million Hispanics who call America home, why they should vote for you to be the next president of the United States. And with that, we'll close. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for inviting me. I think we've covered a lot of territory. It's been a very good discussion. Thank you for the hospitality. I think our country's in crisis right now. What we're doing isn't working. Millions of people across America are hurting. The Hispanic community is hurting. The Obama economic policies have produced stagnation and misery and malaise. And the people that have been hurt the most are the most vulnerable. We have got to change course. Now, I'll give you a word of optimism. I think people are waking up. I think they're waking up all over this country. They're waking up and realizing this doesn't make any sense. The taxes and regulations are hammering small businesses and killing jobs. Obamacare is hurting millions across this country. Our constitutional rights are under assault from Washington like never before. And the Obama-Clinton foreign policy has only encouraged the rise of radical Islamic terrorism, has allowed Iran to get closer and closer to have nuclear weapons, has allowed ISIS to get in a position where they're beheading and crucifying Christians has encouraged dictators like Putin to invade Russia's neighbors. I think people across this country recognize we can't keep doing what we're doing. And this is a matter of common sense. It's not right or left or Democrat or Republican. It's common sense. If you think Washington is working well, if you're happy with the ways of Washington, and you want the next president to be someone who will fiddle around the edges but not fundamentally change this town, then I ain't your guy. I think what we're doing right now, we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids. And it is fundamentally immoral. The last six years under President Obama, the national debt's gone from 10 trillion to 18 trillion, larger than our GDP, and I would note under the preceding president, George W. Bush, it went from $5 trillion to $10 trillion. The biggest divide we've got politically in this country, I don't think it's between Republicans and Democrats. It's between career politicians in Washington and the American people. And, you know, as I travel the country, the people who stop me most frequently are valets and bellhops, waiters and waitresses, taxi cab drivers, the conductor on Amtrak. And they all say the same thing. I remember one gentleman was parking cars outside a New York hotel. He's an African-American man in his 60s, was an immigrant from Haiti, who stopped me, grabbed me by the shoulders, looked me in the eyes and said, thank you for fighting for me. Nobody else is fighting for me. People are fed up with Washington, and they're looking for someone willing to take on the entrenched power in Washington and to move power back to the American people. That's what this campaign is about. It's about empowering the American people to actually fix the problem, stop talking about them, and pull back from the fiscal and economic ledge 
we're facing. Stop bankrupting our kids. Get back to booming economic growth. And I'll say this as a final point. An awful lot of people you talk to say, you know, I, I agree. I agree we need tax reform. We need regulatory reform. We need to get back to common sense principles. But is it possible? Is it possible to turn this country around? An analogy that I often point to is the late 70s. I think the parallels between Barack Obama and Jimmy Carter are uncanny. And what happened in the late 70s was millions of men and women came together and became the Reagan Revolution. And it did not come from Washington, D.C. Washington despised Reagan. It came from the American people. The reason I'm optimistic and encouraged is the same thing is happening. This campaign is all about empowering courageous conservatives, bringing back the old Reagan coalition of conservatives and libertarians and evangelicals and young people and Hispanics and women and Reagan Democrats to get back to the common sense values this country was built on. We're seeing that happening. And I'm convinced the only way we turn this country around and pull back from the abyss we're facing is if the American people rise up at the grassroots and say, this isn't working, we need a new path. That's what our campaign's ho hoping to do, fighting to do, and I hope to be able to earn your support. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Cruz. Senator. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think we're going to have some of our folks come in.